Hello, everybody. Welcome to Couchbase Connect 2020. And this is the welcome to the new normal as well. Uh, it's my first time that I'm doing a, a keynote sitting down. And I'm sure for some of you, it's the first time you're actually sitting in your lounge clothes and uh, with your laptop someplace where your favorite spot of your house or elsewhere and enjoying these sessions. So welcome to the new normal. Um, my intention here was to give you a, a very high level sense of the journey that we have embarked on, which is um, all about convergence. So I want to talk to you about the convenience of convergence. And what better place to start talking about this than uh, what's sort of we're all facing one way or the other, which is the amount of time that we are actually spending um, outside of work is primarily with all the lack of travel and outdoor activities. A good chunk of our time we're spending in front of our other screen uh, TVs where streaming has become uh, a, a major uh, major need for all of us. Uh, binge watching is the thing. Now, you know, when you depend so much on something, uh, which has become that critical a streaming capability for all the entertainment, uh, as you can expect in my home, um, Murphy's Law hit. Uh, things when you need them most, they fail. And the streaming uh, device that I was using uh, recently failed. And my experience of going through that made me think about what we do for a living as well, which is enterprise applications and sophisticated applications at scale. There are a lot of similarities here. You know, that lovely little wall you're seeing out there is perhaps one of the most expensive wire hiders. I mean, it's just hiding a bunch of wires behind it. I purposefully got that sort of wall set up built. So the wires are not seen, but the setup is a plasma TV. Uh, which is connected, which has got this. Behind the scenes is also pretty interesting. Let me come to that, but just give you a sense of what the setup is. It's a, it's a plasma TV, uh, my favorite. When I bought this, this was the third most expensive thing ever. After my house and my car, this was the thing. Uh, it's uh, this, the picture comes through there. The sound uh, is powered by a, a Dan and audio video receiver. Uh, best uh, of its class at the time when I bought it. And um, it's uh, the content basically that comes from uh, a set-top box for TV, uh, a streaming um, media device, a, a PlayStation device for gaming. And all these are routed through a, uh, a HDMI switch. So that's the complexity that is actually hidden behind these walls. It sort of looks something like this. And as you can imagine, every kind of interface that was ever invented to put uh, audio video system together is behind the wall. Perhaps not a, not an RS-232, but other than that, you talk to me about any standards, I got them. Uh, DVI, check. HDMI, check. Component, check. Um, the audio, optical audio, check. Um, uh, you can keep going like this, anything that you needed because it's been sort of uh, assembled together for the best of breed of their capabilities. Now, when this thing sort of all of a sudden one fine day, my um, streaming media device stopped sending the signal. And obviously I had to first check all my dongles, all the connectors to make sure that there was no issues there. As part of that whole journey, I learned so much. You know, this is where all the communities and forums were very useful. I learned a lot about HDCP, HDMI, HDCP 2.2, HDMI new standards, DVI to HDMI standards, and uh, HD, HDCP scraping. There are switches. And then, how do you route your audio through uh, opti digital optical versus video through that? What are the pitfalls of that, all my setup just came back to me to bite me because what has happened in this process is that in the last few years, HDMI is the only standard, none of this other stuff. Nobody sends audio signal one way and the video the other way. So in order for me to solve all this problem after having read through uh, every possible forum on audio video, um, uh, audio video files, if you will, have written about, I finally figured the one way for me to solve a problem is to add yet another device. So I went and got, uh, I had a Roku, but there's a catch. This was the one that, that was built in 2016. 
Why? Because the latest models do not have the capability of routing uh, audio separately from the video because only HDMI goes. So then uh, you had to get that 2016, which routes the audio through uh, the digital optical and the media through that. Uh, and the HDMI DVI interface does not, you know, uh, sort of uh, block the signals, all that stuff. Finally figured out the whole problem. Things are working fine, back to normal, very happy. At the end of all of this, the sensation that, that came to me was, wow, I really debugged this problem. One of those race condition ones, you know, which you, which you never know. <laughs> uh, this has that satisfaction of figuring out uh, that complex uh, issue. When I was going through all this stuff, this, this whole dongle problem is the first thing that came to my sort of mind to see that, look at the complexity of this setup and where else I remind, reminded of this setup. To me, it's a classic enterprise application scenario. Why is also because various technologies have come at various points in time and they were the best. So enterprises go and get the best possible technologies and put their applications together using this infrastructure, just like I had cobbled up components and digital audio and HDMI and all that kind of stuff. When you put these things together, um, what you really have is this the dongle problem that I actually faced, where at least in the hardware world, things are a little bit more, um, how do you say, standardized. HDMIs, uh, the male to female connection, all that stuff that's over there built, it's, it's well understood. Within that, there could be sort of complexities of versioning and uh, uh, signal dropping and stuff like that versus in the enterprise infrastructure space, not only do the, inter the interfaces themselves move because APIs change, but then the but then the protocols change, and then the logic that you need to apply to process the data that sort of comes through changes. So it's a fairly sophisticated uh, uh, programming that is required. It is not just a case of connecting things together, though it appears like that in diagram. There is sophisticated application logic that is actually sitting to process. And especially in the data uh, domain, what has happened is that in the last 40 odd years, uh, various technologies have emerged, uh, relational databases, search systems, analytics, caching, uh, queuing, all these technologies have come at various points in time. And so you had to basically develop these connectors and ship data from one system to the other every time in order for you to sort of solve this application need, uh, which is ever growing, but the, your infrastructure on which you built this stuff has been built at various stages with various assumptions. So you have to put these things together. Now, more recently, of course, people would tell you that it is sort of, in one sense, things have gotten easier at least with the cloud coming into the picture. Yes, cloud has helped a lot in terms of uh, giving you a standard way of infrastructure, but at the same time, it has, if anything, uh, added more to this complexity, this, this stew that you have to actually now cook, because with more options comes more choice. And with the choice that you are going to sort of stitch things together, the complexity of what you have to maintain exponentially increases. It's not just a one for one, as you can imagine, you have to have multiple connectors and data floating between multiple systems. And these connectors, these dongles, you know, is something you have to remember, unlike my dongles, which I sort of bought once, these you're renting. And these, every time you use any of these dongles, you're paying for this connectivity that you're actually establishing between these things. So yes, it has solved. Yes, it has given more power, but at the same time, the complexity or uh, in the general terminology, this is the data sprawl. The data sprawl has only sort of proliferated even more. And, this is the necessary step. We have to go through this step to get to the, uh, the logical next steps that we will be discussing. So how do you basically solve this complexity, this problem? It just cannot you know, keep on exploding of this nature. I'm sure uh, many of us have thought through and lived through and have tried in our own ways to sort of contain this problem. So uh, we at Couchbase have been sort of thinking about this and uh, we want to bring the convenience of convergence. So a lot more can be done uh, with a lot less and not just managing 
you know, the interfaces and connectivity and, you know, the problem that I went through uh, to get a simple signal upon my plasma again. Um, now, we can draw inspiration uh, from this sort of convergence that has happened in other spaces, the most famous of them being the consumer electronics industry. And this started way back, even in the uh, 70s and early 80s with, you know, two in ones and stuff like that. But where it has landed now is as a smart device, a smartphone, which is basically 40 devices into one. So you don't have to have 40 separate devices. Can you imagine carrying all these devices together to get a job done? And yes, there had been other convergence in the past, but it is like, imagine taking a picture in your SLR, which had Wi-Fi connectivity and trying to send that to your bunch of friends with a little caption, impossible to do that. Versus these days, you can go to a smartphone and start texting in the middle of it. Well, why not attach a picture and send that to the people also? So it's become that convenience is sort of built into the system. It is not something that you have to engineer separately. That is sort of uh, an inspiration from uh, that we took to see what is it that we could do in the, in the domain of data, uh, because this sprawl has come to a point where it requires uh, creative new thinking and solving the problem. And that is the Couchbase database, a platform uh, which sort of converges your need uh, for performance and scale, which starts with cash like characteristics. But at the same time, you want the consistency and durability of a database, which is where relational systems really excel. And you want to that, you want to add the capability to search for the information that is sitting there in the database then you want sort of an ability to analyze and find insights in that data. All this could be done in one converged system if the architecture is right. And now that you've built all this stuff, you would want to extend this to the edge, the mobile deployments. So this is a system where an uh, edge database and a syncing capability sort of built into it. And finally, how to sort of orchestrate the management of all of this because it's sort of uh, the proliferation makes it sort of difficult to manage at a certain level. So Kubernetes is, is the sort of chosen orchestration tier here so that when it runs on a container, then the Kubernetes operator takes care of all the deployment. You can code the deployment. Uh, there are some important uh, uh, problems that we have solved in this area as well. So that's the sort of uh, couch base vision of how we could solve uh, uh, the database sprawl or the data sprawl. Now, if you sort of go back and look at this diagram, what you are basically seeing is that a very neat, in one sense, a look of where different sort of caching analytics and relational systems all coming together. It sort of looks neat, but the anatomy of this is a little bit more um, stark. And what actually you're doing in one sense, and now these days when we do microservices, it gives us further uh, freedom and what we end up doing is, of course, with each microservice, you can have your own persistence tier. So for a certain type of service, I'm gonna have a cache kind of property. So I'm gonna use a caching tier to sort of store the data and then key value. So each one has a set of application logic, which is the back end business logic, so to say. Then it's got its own persistence tier. Then it has got all this connectivity tiers, the dongles. So you can choose you know, multitude of systems, but then you have to engineer their connectivity. And every time you use different data store and you're using the data that went into your operational and then you caching it or moving it to an analytic system or moving it to a search system, what you really end up having or the price you pay is consistency. You never get the same result from all these places. Or if you want to get them, you have to orchestrate between all these systems and that's quite painful. So this application, <clears throat> extra code that you're writing, you know, and we sort of at sometimes we all hide behind this, you know, agile development. Yes, we are agile. Yes, we are doing a lot more things a lot quickly, but half the time we're just running from sidelines to sidelines as opposed to making vertical progress. I'm using a American uh, football analogy here where, you know, you're just not getting anywhere near the goal. You're just doing a lot of work Absolutely, you're busy, absolutely. But it is not making the progress of actually your goal of achieving application uh, deployment faster. 
that's you are impeded in that by all these sort of overheads that you're carrying of data connectivity, data replication. And the process is costing you more also because you're duplicating the data, which is compute network and storage, and then you're computing them back together. So that's the logic that is actually running a lot more of that behind your sort of uh, application user interface logic. That is what needs to be simplified. And that can be simplified if you have a system where you don't have to keep moving the data. The other way people have uh, articulated this is to say that you are basically sort of moving the data to where the logic is, as opposed to bring the logic to the data. And if you, if you see the right way to sort of architect this, you know, <laughs> we believe is to have a system where your needs are met in a manner where you don't have to move the data versus these different application logic can run on the same platform isolated from each other. So one doesn't compete for resource with the other and with a uniform sort of programming interface that is built. So you keep adding your business logic to the same data and thereby you are able to see the multiplier effect of what you're trying to do. This is how we can make vertical progress because there are no more dongles here. You will still have your external interfaces and stuff like that where you need them. And we have our capabilities built in there for integration to move the data to external systems, but not to perform a whole gamut of operational uh, requirements that you have in your application. You can start with your existing architecture by simply using Couchbase as the cache. And then you can extend one microservice at a time from your legacy systems onto Couchbase. And that's one sort of design pattern that many of our customers have used to come off of uh, their uh, legacy and older systems. So in one system, you can have a, in this converged database, workloads concurrently running, which are extremely performance and scale sensitive, like a cache and a key value store sort of operations. You can do uh, sub-second operational database queries, select star from, or you can do object.find kind of logic to find a textual analysis and look for patterns, tokens, tokenized searches. You can do analytics, complex MPP logic, all con concurrently running in one system, one not impeding the other. So you can have microsecond response times in key value, millisecond response times in operational queries, um, and millisecond response times for your searches, and yet seconds and tens of seconds response times for analytics because they are complex queries, all happening concurrently in the system. You can do reactive programming to the data that is sitting there truly with the eventing capabilities, and you can use that to eventually move your data selectively outside the system as well. So that, in one sense, is how uh, Couchbase is sort of uh, architected. Now let's look at the you know the programming elements of this thing because that's where you know the rubber meets the road, so to say. With Couchbase, you pick the favorite SDK that you like, write the application different types of application logic in one place, instead of you having to use multiple systems and build connectors. And then when it comes to deployment, you can deploy this using the Kubernetes operator from any cloud and all the way to edge. And the beauty out there is also that that can also be coded. And that's the beauty that I'll sort of talk to you a little bit later. So in one place, you can write your you know, key value logic, you're using the flexible schema, write your familiar SQL applications. You can have your asset transactions and your high performance uh, operations. Um, your million ops per second can happen as well as your transactions per second that you want to achieve both in the same place. Uh, textual analysis, insights using analytics, all can be achieved in one application paradigm. You don't have to learn multiple uh, paradigms, if you will. You don't have to learn like a key value and a NoSQL on one end, a SQL in, on one side, and then uh, you know, uh, a columnar store or some other logic for your analytical capabilities. All can be sort of uh, unified and synthesized in one way, uh, which is one difficulty that you have when you choose multiple systems. 
having to learn multiple uh, programming paradigms. This one other added benefit of all of this is also that, you know, you will pay lesser cost and maintenance of your code because it's easy um, because of the consistency of it, number one. Number two, there's also uh, added benefit in terms of securing all this data because you know the surface area well here because of the APIs that you are sort of using in this one platform. If you use 10 different platforms, the threat surface area just uh, sort of increases. Now you have to go secure all those APIs. This is another benefit that our customers find by using this, uh, this convergence of multiple platforms into one. Now, how does it all look? Some of you developers out there are getting already antsy about, you know, uh, how, how do we use this system? Just as an example, I'm going to walk you through a few sample code, uh, how it looks. The first example that you're seeing here is a simple key value with a get set insert um, uh, semantics that you can basically do uh, with Couchbase. The second one, you can now do this with, uh, you know, frameworks, um, object frameworks, where you can manipulate at the object level. And uh, here are the examples of Spring Data. So you can operate at your favorite programming language using the favorite uh, uh, framework. And in the case of Java, you can use Spring Data or, or .NET, or um, in the case of uh, uh, Node.js, uh, you can use uh, Ottoman. There are a lot of interfaces uh, which allow you to program an object here. And that, if you have to get to us, uh, get to a state where you want to issue straight up SQL queries to manipulate data, that's also possible. Uh, you can see that example, uh, give you the, how you can pass the whole query string right down to the database. The third is an example of you actually doing transactions. Uh, you start at the, the context uh, of a transaction, then you can uh, do multi-document asset transactions uh, anything within the transactional block is uh, achieves the asset consistency. And eventually when you hit that commit, that's when the actual data is written to the database. So this gives you the classic um, uh, transactional semantics that we are all used to in relational systems. Now, the beauty here is that you can interleave these things. You can have a multiple key value operations happening concurrently with the transaction right in the middle of that. This has not been traditionally easy to achieve. This is one reason why the NoSQL and other systems came because they were for performance at scale. And when you want a transaction, you would rather take the, the pay the penalty of it in one sense, and yet use relational systems that, that have been the tried and trusted ones. So you have to choose separate system. It's not just that you know people just went and uh, cobbled together all these things out of just sheer fun. There is a necessity to do that thing. That is one problem that we've also solved here. So the way it is solved is that you as a developer have the ability to pick and choose when you want to pay the price of a transaction when you don't want to. This is all but at the API level, you can set the context and set the flags and you achieve transaction. If you want, if you're updating a revenue number or a, you know, balancing two accounts or um, <clears throat> manipulating sensitive data, you can use that. But if you're just uploading a picture and changing your user profile of some form, you can just do that uh, without paying all the transactional costs by just doing a simple key value operation. So in the interleaving of these is very important. That's one of the uh, main benefits of a system like Couchbase. You no longer have to choose uh, two separate systems and pay different prices, a different thing. You uh, determine how much you want to pay when, transactional cost or operational cost, and you sort of can uh, continue to leverage both in the same system uh, by using the same standard set of APIs. Now to this, you can add more logic and the full power of SQL is available to you, by which I mean, uh, you can do joins uh, between two documents, which is the opposing thumb to write any sophisticated enterprise application logic. And it's got the full power of uh, uh, SQL 92 equivalent where you can do sub queries and you can do totals and sums and averages and you can even do common table expressions and all that stuff is available to you, the full power of that. 
the the main thing out there is uh, it's a language. It's not just a set of APIs that is cobbled together. It's a language, which means it's got composability. You can compose uh, the, your idea uh, of how you want to manipulate the data and you tell the system what you want to do and the system will take care of how to do it. So you don't have to do all the manipulation or the logic of manipulating the data. The system takes care of it and it'll flatten the data and give it to you. Somewhere in there, you should see an unnest. There it is, sixth or seventh line. So at the end of the day, it'll pick the data that you really are looking for after having done all the select Cartesian product and the projects and then give it to you in a form that is easily consumable for both displaying and further consumption. And there is search where we have a full inverted index built TF, IDF, and all the textual analysis capabilities built into that. Vector distancing, facetting, everything is available to you. Why this is important is because we are playing with JSON. And JSON is human readable, which means you should be able to search on it and find further insights from there. Information retrieval, data retrieval in one place, it simplifies your life. And finally, there's analytics where you can do similar as you can see the select syntax out there is pretty similar to the 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 query the nickel side of the equation yes uh, both have this similar syntax but the operation uh, the operational complexity of how analytic system works is very different and so it's an mpp architecture where you can actually um, parallelize multiple of these queries so you can find your ad hoc queries come back faster these are uh, very important when you really don't know what you're looking for until you really hit upon that query, then you can go build an index and speed it up and stuff like that. But until then, that hot querying capability, that's how you find your insight. You experiment a bunch of times with various queries and that gives you, the analytics gives you the capability. The beauty uh, here is that no ETL is required because you started with a JSON, which is flexible schema, which means sort of there is, your schema is sort of late binding. On the analytics side, that shows up as a benefit of not having to take this schema that you had defined on the operational side and break that into your facts and dimensions and whatever else you need to do to your star, star schema and everything else on the analytics side. And that benefit of you simply annotating your data further and moving it to the analytics side where you can find your insights is very, very powerful. It sort of shrinks a lot of development time uh, for basically just this ETL operation. Yes, the work that you have to do in terms of mapping of the data and sort of cleansing of the data, that, that is always the case. But the mechanics of moving the data from operational system to an analytical system is completely programmatically doable now. So that those are the kinds of logic you can add to that. There's further we can do reactive programming to this whole thing. With uh, the moment the data walks into uh, couch base, you can register callbacks, which is our eventing capability and it's fully uh, sort of, it's nothing proprietary here, it's JavaScript. So you can register those JavaScript logic, which will fire and it'll basically take appropriate action based on uh, uh, the, the logic that you have sort of specified. In this case, we are talking about uh, time to expire kind of logic uh, and you can take action based on this. If let's say there are insurance policies which are coming to sort of maturation tomorrow, you can set up timers to say that, you know, take action on it, send all those insurance holders uh, a notification saying that, make sure that you have paid up your premium and stuff like that. Such application logic can be now just fired without you having to do some sophisticated data um, jugglery. Just simply register a callback and based on the it's not just time to expire. There are other logic that you can actually use by introspecting other columns that are sitting or that are sitting in the documents. Now, to all of this, uh, you, when you have developed this application, uh, you can extend it all the way to your uh, edge as well. And you can build the application on the edge using our uh, mobile APIs. We database that is purpose built uh, for mobile applications and you can write your logic on that side you can start with the mobile first uh, application development paradigm as well where the data is all synced as you can see one of the last step that it does is here sync to the server side so you just need to have a server side um, url where the data needs to go 
instantaneously you can have millions of devices syncing data back to the server. No need for any mobile backend as a service. It's built, purpose built for you. You just have to register what types of documents you want to see. And there are different channels uh, that you can register to, and then you get the data that's uh, from the mobile device to the server and changes in the server are getting synced back to the mobile. It's handled at the data tier. You program your application logic, and data just comes to you. This saves a lot from the standpoint of both data movement as well as application development. So that's the uh, sort of uh, programming paradigms that we have uh, sort of enhanced here. Once you have developed all this stuff, now it comes the time to deploy this. And one of the important problems that all, always has existed with relational or any database technology so far is that only this tier demands this data plane management and the control plane, two separate systems, uh, so that you can keep uh, the data movement uh, control at a different tier, so to say, which requires a lot of manual intervention, a lot of scripting, a lot of downtimes, all that goes away with Couchbase. It starts like the schema flexibility, the auto sharding capability. Because of all of that, eventually we're able to provide you a system which you can code the deployment along with the coding that you did for your application. All the CI CD conversation these days comes to a crunching halt the moment the database change is required. That problem goes away with Couchbase. You can specify the deployment uh, necessities once you have determined what the application changes have done. Both can be coded and both can be deployed at the same time. So you can sequence it to say that, you know, uh, make these changes to the database, uh, add a couple more nodes, bring them all up, now deploy the application code, ready to go. So that control plane is now the, the sort of the marketing term these days, many people use this infrastructure as code. In one sense, this is database as code. That's what you're getting here with the work we have done on Kubernetes operator, where we have extended uh, some of the controller capabilities uh, to allow you to deploy database in a Kubernetes context by scripting the changes that you want to be affected in the YAML file. So that's a, a, a pretty significant step, a distributed database being managed uh, as a code. And that allows you to deploy this from on-prem, if you that's where you're starting, to one cloud, to multiple clouds, and extend it to the edge. All this is possible as in cloud to cloud, from on-prem to cloud, and cloud to edge, all these are deployable and configurable in one uh, converged system uh, managed and the controlling of it managed through Kubernetes, which is uh, an open standard. And we have uh, <clears throat> made that so easy. So in this DevOps paradigm, uh, developers can operationalize a lot of the stuff or the operational people can code and control how the deployment actually occurs. So this is uh, the main thing I wanted to sort of convey to you in this one was how we have sort of pulled all these paradigms together into a platform and allow you to code in a uniform manner, both the development of it, which could be a key value application, a search application, a standard a transactional application, an analytical application in one place. What's the benefit of all of this is number one, simplicity, number two, speed at which you can sort of agility of from develop to deploy and finally finding insights. All this stuff comes fairly quickly to you. And then finally, the deployment is also now programmable. That gives you the, 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 the power to kind of CDN the data as in move it to wherever the consumption of the data is happening and you can sp spread it and then you can pull it back. Uh, elasticity is a core concept that we have used to build this. So you are able to expand based on your needs and contract whenever you don't really need that kind of scale because it can be seasonal. So those are the uh, important capabilities that we've built into the system. Uh, I hope you will have uh, fun 
playing with this system. It's just a matter of downloading uh, your uh, Couchbase server, setting up your SDKs and fire it up and you'll be able to uh, start having some fun. Um, but before I leave, uh, let me um, show you how uh, perhaps we can quickly play with some of this stuff so you get to see the excitement of what I'm talking about. Well, before I really give you my final thoughts, I remembered one more thing that I wanted to show you guys, uh, which is how we can start writing applications in a simple manner. What if it could just bring your browser and experience the sophistication of this database platform? You know, every time you had to write code that actually touches the database, you ended up with having to do a lot of stuff, install the database, load data, install the client SDKs, fire up your favorite uh, IDEs, install any plugins to connect all these things, load the data of some sample before you can write your first line of code and experience something that is coming back from the database. What if all, all of that sort of went away and you basically could just concentrate on writing the application logic that you want uh, to experiment with uh, the data that is already there and thereby you, your experience of learning gets faster. So with that in mind, what we're working on is a very cool way where you can just bring your browser and experience uh, the Couchbase platform. Let me give you a little sampling of that. Uh, that's going to be coming to a theater near you fairly quickly. I'm just getting set up here. Uh, let me share this. And, uh, you know, I'm showing you just go to a URL and you're now seeing a set of examples. You know, this is a Java example uh, where you're sort of importing your uh, uh, client libraries, you're setting up uh, the cluster connectivity, the username, password, you're setting up a bucket in that, and then you're sort of getting one document, which is sort of already loaded in there, uh, the bucket with the travel sample, and you're getting the airline underscore 10, as you see here. Um, that, that's what the simple key value fetch sort of an application that's sort of written here. This is in Java. Uh, you can see the same thing happen in sort of Python, the same uh, sort of pattern here. Uh, similar exact same thing you can see for uh, Node.js as well. So now if you sort of, you've seen the code, now you want to see this in action, right? Just come and hit the run button here. You run. There's a lot of magic that has happened in the back, which you don't see, which is this the whole stuff that I described is what's happened in the back where you have actually a couch base server instance installed, the client SDK, a loading of the travel sample data set has happened there. And when you make this uh, application code run, it's actually, all this is of course, using the Kubernetes orchestration and stuff. And so it has come up and you are able to get the, the result here. Uh, mile air, it says, and uh, you know, uh, that's the, uh, the one with the, the airline code of underscore 10. So which country, United States, IATA number, Q5, all the other details of this airlines is out here. Fantastic. You can do like, let's say a query type example using a nickel statement, um, which is pretty much the same. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, a, a helper function, uh, get hotel by city. Uh, that is set up, which is actually going to call uh, this set of SQL statement to execute. And the uh, results will be displayed based on this, which will uh, um, uh, display to you uh, the hotels in that city, the name of the hotel, the city and the state information is what will come out. And here you're executing this one where you're gonna pass this famous uh, city, um, Malibu. Now let's just run this example again. Uh, the server instance is spawned and the whole, um, the logic of the database being uh, set up and then queried. Now here you're seeing these results here. Uh, there are, looks like one, two, three, four, five sort of hotels in Malibu. Uh, uh, and you can see 
um, where the name of the hotel and California and La Jolla Valley. So you're getting to see the results out of this one. Now, some of you are already wondering over there, hey, how is it uh, that I can take better advantage of this? Can I go write my own four lines of code to find? Possible. For, an, for example, I was thinking, what if um, some of the customers or wherever this data set that originated, people got a bit lazy and started typing the city name, you know, not very precisely. Let's say they typed it with small case as opposed to using a capital case. This is a SQL query. So it's doing exact match of Malibu with capital letter M. What if you want to sort of experiment to see, I want to see, uh, you know, are there sort of uh, information that is sitting there with small case Malibu or show me all the Malibus that are sitting there in this collection of data. You can write such an application logic. Now, how can you do that? Here is further coolness for you. Let us set up a sort of a private instance for you. Here you're sort of running example after example. Once you step off the example, it is gone. But here, let's go get ourselves a kind of my own instance to play. Right, that's me. If I could type better. All right. And this is important because this is where eventually I will get some links to validate and all that stuff. And then let's make sure that I'm not some bot out there impersonating me and trying to get access to this thing. One, four, five, eight, two, one, beautiful. Get my own session, beautiful. There it is. It's got, even gives you admin UIs over there, query workbench, it's the username, password, and it's got, you know, snippets of code and all that goodies are API documentation. If you want to go look up more information, all that is available. And here is your, uh, all these lovely examples. Let's, we were, this was the one that we were looking at. This is sitting here, right? Now, let's, uh, let me open this in a new tab. Beautiful, go to the server so I can show you what the, before I go there, it'll ask me for username, password. Let me get that, grab that here. That's a username and where is my password? Um, hang on a second, there it is. And let's sign in. This gives you the back end what is happening. Uh, you can see uh, documents. It's already loaded like a couple of uh, sample buckets here, beer sample and travel sample. I want to do the, the search capabilities out here, right? So you can even look at the dashboard. It's got all kinds of reports of data and operation mutations per second. All those goodies are there. Let me go to the search one and set up. One of the things you have to do if you wanted to start searching, as you can imagine, is to create a search index so that I can start searching this. I'm gonna create a new index. I'm gonna call it travel FT. On what bucket? The travel sample bucket. And you know, for now I can just, let me just hit the create index button so it can start doing its stuff. Uh, it's got all kinds of stats and stuff sitting here and it is already building up these documents. It's indexing these documents. It's about 16 person complete. Um, now let's go back to our lovely little example. And I wanna add search logic to this thing. So instead of just getting by the city thing, let us add now it is where I do a little a chef pre, uh, pre, 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 uh, pre-cooked bit where I shall be grabbing some code from my lovely little notepad here uh, and we can get going uh, with the logic here, there. So all I'm doing here, just to add a, so it's readable, uh, setting up a helper function, which is basically looking into this index and uh, it's going to find the it's, um, it's setting up the operator here to get you the terms. Now I'm going to sort of pass, let's say, uh, the Malibu that we really wanted to pass. And here you can search for lowercase Malibus all over the place and see if it can find you more than what we found using the nickel uh, query by Rose. 
Yes, it's already pre-populated with my username, password. Things seems to be in good shape. Let's run this. It's running and I get an object syntax error. Thank God for that. All right, so then now that we have run, what you're seeing here is a result of uh, that search query where you're able to see the Malibus and that our search query sort of uh, displayed earlier, along with a whole bunch of search results here, which match, it's showing us all those document IDs, document ID, document ID, document ID, which in, in the document where the search result is actually sitting uh, with, with, the, with the term match of Malibu. And uh, you can now do further operations on it. I just wrote simple a uh, few lines of code here to show you uh, what is possible. Now that we have that document, we can see the user comments and price ranges and all that kind of stuff that is in there and you can um, further write your application logic. So without you moving any data, you just did a couple of things now, um, which is basically uh, run a key value query, run a regular um, SQL query, and finally, you on the fly added some uh, search logic and uh, you are able to see the results uh, of the search that came along with the, uh, the results that you got from the, the query here. So this shows you that you didn't have to deal with all the dongle problems. Uh, you just wrote your application code, uh, instances were spun up and the data didn't have to be moved. You didn't have to write another connector and crawl the data from your relational system onto a search index and then there's a lag and you will search there, you will not find the information, all that stuff is gone. You're pretty quickly able to get the value uh, of the data that is already sitting in one database and you're able to search along with looking for it in query and a key value way of getting to that data. That's the power of uh, the platform and just bring your browser and start experiencing this stuff. Uh, when you want, when you're ready to write some sophisticated application, simple, just uh, download the server and the, perhaps not, you don't have to download the server. Uh, it's running in the cloud. You just get your client SDKs, uh, your IDEs and write your sophisticated enterprise class application. So that's how we expect this thing to change the game, uh, simplify it for you so that you can uh, spend uh, your time in your creative zone and not have to uh, deal with all the, the, the portering of data from one system to the other and uh, sort of you know, lugging them along and connecting them. Uh, hope this was uh, a fun for you. Uh, and now let me really get to my closing thoughts. Now that we have seen uh, the power of how we can bring uh, the, uh, just come with the browser and you can experience this, the power of this platform. Now let me uh, really um, final thoughts. Uh, it's been fun building what we have built and a, a, a great team of engineers have been working, toiling really hard uh, to bring these uh, cool capabilities and features to all of you. Um, let me highlight a few of these sessions, which are, uh, if you have the time, worth listening to both by our own engineers uh, and some by some some of our esteemed customers and some of our partners. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, you know, you may want to learn more about the, the mobile stuff. Uh, Wayne and Priya are talking about a lot of the stuff that we're doing with our customers on the edge. Um, uh, so is one of our partners. Uh, Daniel will be talking about um, how they use this for in the, in the medical emergency sector, uh, ambulances syncing with uh, hotel, uh, hospitals. So that's a pretty uh, a, a nice use case to um, sort of get to see this in play. Uh, Neil is talking about uh, our um, cross data center replication capabilities. Uh, one of the most popular uh, features of Couchbase and how this will allow you to do active active replicas. This has been a, a sort of a, a pipe dream for many of our, uh, of our customers who have sort of starting to use this capability, but it's a fairly sophisticated uh, piece, of, um, piece of programming and uh, magic that they have pulled off in the backend 
to allow you to have these active active deployments across clusters which are spanning geographies. Um, uh, you know, Michael Nitschinger's session on uh, the shell would be an interesting one to see some uh, cool stuff we are doing by extending the shell uh, so you can do more of the database um, uh, management and querying right from the command shell uh, would be interesting um, geeky little session where you can uh, see the beauty, beauty of that. Of course, on the analytics front, there are a lot of uh, interesting stuff and uh, you know, Professor Mike Carey and uh, Idris are doing a session. That's a great one to um, uh, take a look at so you can understand the thought that has gone behind building an MPP system and the benefit it brings. Um, we also have a lovely session on Kubernetes by Anil, uh, important one. And uh, you know, this session by Constantine uh, of how they sort of use Couchbase would be mind boggling for many of you. Um, this is how uh, the UPS is uh, use case. So you're all touched by what he's doing over there. You may not realize it, but he'll give you a sense of that. A lot of interesting sessions of this nature. Um, the mainframe offload one um, that you can see uh, down bottom right, a very important one uh, where you'll hear from uh, both Couchbase people as well as uh, our partners, uh, Vagnish from Infosys and Nick from Red Hat, uh, uh, along with um, more developer experience stuff at the Ottoman stuff that Arun and Eric would be talking. Uh, interesting sessions all around in terms of technology, uh, how not just us, how customers and how partners uh, are bringing these things together um, would be very interesting for you all to um, uh, get to know. And uh, the session that Tony and Matt McDonough are doing would be good for you to see how you can uh, engage with us uh, and how the partner community is sort of developed and you can uh, work with us to enhance the product and take it to the next level. So um, it's been exciting time for me uh, to sort of work with uh, this set of talented individuals and bring this product. And uh, I'm really excited for the possibilities. If anything, COVID has made all of us realize that um, uh, how distributed we are going to get and yet be connected and be uh, able to collaborate and bring uh, value to each other and value to the to the company and how we can move uh, the, as a society forward. And this sort of technologies uh, have a role to play in making the future better for all of us. And you all are pretty key to this whole thing by bringing uh, to life the sort of applications that we all have not yet imagined. And I hope uh, the platform that we have built enables you to express your creativity and build interesting applications. That's, that's what we all hope for. Uh, that's what we do all this work for. So thank you very much for um, spending the last half an hour or so with me and I look forward to seeing you all in the virtual hallways and uh, maybe grab a virtual beer and further this conversation. Thank you.